My guest for this episode is Tim Yo. He coaches introverts, helps them have impact and influence without pretending to be extroverts at The Quiet Achiever. He's currently a design director at IBM and he helps enterprise clients transform their businesses with enterprise scale at startup speed. Tim and I are gonna talk a lot about introversion, the job search, job interviews, leadership, and how to be an introvert and still get ahead in your career. I'm Larry Cornette, and this is Invincible Career. So, hey, Tim, thanks for coming to the show. We've been talking for uh, for years now, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's mm. been a while that we've actually uh, met each other a long time ago and kind of bonded over some common interests that we have in common background. So I thought maybe we could start with you talking a little bit more about who you are, what your background is, and let the audience know what you've been up to. Mm. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this with this podcast with you for a while now. And my name is Tim Yeo, um, and I've been a designer for the last 18 years, uh, mostly for startups that you probably never heard of in Australia. Um, I was originally from Singapore. Um, uh, that's where I started my career. Um, I was a user experience designer. Back in the day when I started as a user experience designer, the term user experience didn't even really exist back then. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. Yeah. And over time, I've done that for the last 18 years. And yeah, I moved to Australia about 10 years ago. Um, I think where I really cut my teeth was really working at fintech startups here in Sydney, Australia. Um, one of them did money transfers, one of them did business loans, and another did financial comparisons. And through that journey, I suppose inside of me, I've always felt like there was a leader within me that wanted to really push the envelope, get things done, shape the world the way that I saw I wanted it to be, um, the way I saw as a path forward to achieve these things was to be a leader, to be a design leader. The challenge that I brushed up against really was there was no picture of um, what an introverted leader actually looks like, no role model right, that I could right. really look yeah. up to. Um, and by, if you haven't guessed so by now, um, I identify as an introvert. Um, for as long as I can remember, I always identify as an introvert. Um, my happy place is usually reading books on the weekend as opposed to partying <laughs> out at the clubs <laughs> on the weekend. Um, and that's where my happy place is. Uh, my happy place is in pushing pixels and in crafting work. Um, yeah. But a lot of the picture of what um, leaders look like um, even today, really, back then, especially so, but even today, that role model of what a picture leader looks like was usually an extroverted picture. Mm -hmm. And for many years in my career, I pretended because that was the only way I saw as the way to become a leader in an organization. It meant mm -hmm. being able to do public speaking. It meant being able to go to networking events. Um, and then exchange names and meet people. Uh, but the real me, the real me really um, wasn't like any of these things. Um, <laughs> and after a while, I just got tired. I just got tired of pretending. Yeah, yeah. And it probably led to where you and I met because about two, two years ago, I started The Quiet Achiever, um, right. where I call myself the chief introvert. <laughs> but really, it's a we help introverts have impact and influence without pretending to be extroverts. And so nice. all about yeah. the tiny habits that I've practiced over the years that still feel very authentically me as an introvert, but still help you accomplish the things that, um, that you want to do and to be able to lead, but feeling a lot more like your authentic self. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely very similar <laughs> to the, some of the experiences I had too. I, very same. I, I was a designer as well um, for most of my tech career before I went into product management. 
And then I got into management and uh, leadership and it was the same thing where I felt like, okay, I've got to be more extroverted. I've got to stand up in the room more. I've got to argue more, had to do a lot more public presentation and public speaking. Um, And like you said, pretty much all the leaders that I noticed that were at the top were pretty extroverted. At least they pretended to be if they weren't. Mm. And so there wasn't a lot of good models for this. And, um, yeah, I don't think it was until I was reading Susan Cain's book that I was like, maybe there is mm. a different way, <laughs> you know, maybe it is really interesting to look at what are kind of the, the powers of being introverted, the strengths, instead of it always being a problem. Um, yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about that because I think, I think it's still a problem, uh, in most corporate uh, industries in the tech industry that, typical extroverted behavior is seen as the ideal and it's often shows up in the competencies if you look at career ladders like oh you need to lead a meeting oh you need to stand up and defend things more oh you need to be able to argue with the executives there's a lot of that type of behavior that is considered necessary to move up the career ladder uh and the introverted stuff is seen as a problem. You know, it's like you're too quiet. You don't have enough executive presence. You're not speaking in front of other people as much. Uh, or you want more time to go off and think about things and work on it. You know, I want you to come up with an idea right now. You know, you got 15 seconds, come up with something right now, which is just not how introverted people work. And you coach a lot of folks that identify as mm. introverts. And I think a lot of designers too. What are you seeing in terms of their experiences? You know, they're coming to you for help. Um, what are they experiencing as introverts in the corporate world that's making them reach out to you? Mm. Well, I think till this day, I've probably coached about 100, 200 introverts uh, since wow. November 2021. Um, <laughs> that's huge. And, the, and there's a pattern. Um, they come with the yeah. same challenges that they face. How to be more visible in their organization. Mm-hmm. How to network in a way that feels a lot more authentic. How to speak up more in meetings. A lot of them come with feedback from their bosses who tell them, you should speak up more. Because in the cultures where they work in, uh, speaking up is participation. Um, However, it fails to realize two things. Number one, culturally, depending on where you work, some cultures, like mine, for example, I come from an Asian background. When I worked in Asia, you don't speak up unless you know that the thing you Mm -hmm. want to say is true and correct. Um, But in a Western culture, um, speaking up sometimes can be participation. And when you don't speak up, you can be seen as disengaged. So there's a cultural aspect. But there's also what you mentioned earlier about the dichotomy between introversion and extroversion. What I've noticed in my coaching is it doesn't apply to everybody, but the pattern seems to be the same, where extroverts tend to talk to think, but introverts Mm -hmm. tend to think before they talk. And the problem that we've all faced, especially in meetings, how many of us have actually gone to meetings that you that um, there aren't any agendas beforehand, um, yeah. <laughs> where people actually show up and they figure out what do you need to talk about? Um, right. Not having agenda beforehand is not just bad for introverts because the introverts that I've coached they've been amazing preppers. You know, give them minutes, yeah. hours, yeah. a couple of days before the session. Give them time to process, um, collect their thoughts and come with a very crafted uh, response or meaningful Mm -hmm. contributions they can make during the meeting. You know, running meetings that way is great for not just introverts, but for everyone. The problem is that it just doesn't happen often enough. And when you call a meeting without an agenda and you expect people to perform on the spot, what you're really doing is you're buying support, you're biasing performance to people who can't perform on the spot. And the reality is it's for people that have more of those interactions, being able to perform on the spot. And that tends to be the extroverted person. Doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that 
you are probably not setting up the introverts in your in your org, in your in your space, in your team for success. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of the things that we do and we've done historically to make accommodations for people have actually ended up being better for everybody. <laughs> and uh, that is a great example where, you know, having an agenda ahead of time helps everybody get their head straight about why are we meeting? What's the goal? Where, what are we trying to accomplish? Having mm. more time for people to prepare and research means the meeting can actually be effective and about collaboration instead of people showing up. And I've been in these meetings. What are we here for? What are, what are we talking about? I haven't seen that data. I haven't seen anything. And so you spend the entire meeting just trying to get everybody up to speed. When if everybody had done their offline homework, they would have mm -hmm. come completely informed and said, okay, let's actually make this session really impactful. You know, mm -hmm. let's do the collaboration. And it's interesting because I think if I look at this weird world we're in right now, where people are either working 100% remote or hybrid, where they're coming into the office occasionally. The reason you should get together and the reason you should have meetings and come into the office and meet is to have those moments when being together makes sense. And reading a document and doing research and learning all the data that is not a group effort. <laughs> That's something that everyone can do on their own. You know, mm. everyone can go off, brainstorm, come up with ideas, research the problem, and then come together and use the sum of the parts, bringing all these minds together at the same time to then do something that you can't do separately, which is what you should be doing. So it's funny that you mentioned that because I think you're absolutely right. A lot of what we do to make things better for our introverted employees isn't something that's extra effort or hard for the manager or the team or the meeting uh, preparer. It's good for everybody. We would actually be a mm. lot more effective if we, if we perform that way. Um, mm. there's probably a lot of things like that. I, I want to dive a little bit into, um, leadership. So you and I have talked a lot about this and we were just talking about how we thought we had to behave to be leaders. What is your impression now, given that you've been thinking about this a lot more and you're coaching people into management roles and, and leadership roles and you yourself were a leader. What do you think about this now in terms of the difference of an introverted leader and what that means for their style and for their organization and, and things like that. We should probably start at the very beginning where what is people's definition of what a leader is? Um, mm -hmm. I'll share my mm -hmm. definition. Um, my definition of a leader is a person that has followers. It's not a role. Um, it's not a title. You don't automatically start leading when you're given the title or role of team lead right. yeah. or head of or manager. Um, you can start leading and directing a group of people. And if people are following you and they like your way of thinking, your approach and way of working, then I would think you're a leader. Just having the title of head of or VP doesn't make you a leader. Mm. Um, you could have... You could have those titles, but have no followers. And in my opinion, yeah. you're probably not a leader. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's absolutely true. So, so for me, that was, that's my definition of leadership, having followers. And really, the sum of my work um, that I've been doing in The Quiet Achiever is to help people realize that to be a leader, even if, or to be a leader, it doesn't require you to have a revolutionary change in the way they behave or the way that you operate. To have impact and influence is really a sum of tiny habits that you practice every single day. It could be how to network better, better both online and in real life. It could be learning how to speak up um, in meetings when it's time for you to actually speak up and participate and share your point of view rather than holding back and waiting and, then, and not speaking up. It's about how to make small talk so they can grow the, the circle of people that you know within your organization and outside of it. 
um, all these are small things that you can practice every single day that may not come as naturally to introverts because that might not be their happy place. But the trick here is really finding tiny habits um, that can help you operate and perform those roles that you need to do to, to be a leader. So mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, one of the challenges that a lot of introverts come with is how do I actually speak up in meetings? Because I'm still processing. My thinking is not fully formed yet. You know, I don't really want to speak up now because I'm afraid that what I have to say um, sounds silly or, you know, it's not fully yeah. formed yet. I just need a little bit more time. And a tiny habit I encourage them to try is to give yourself permission to speak up, right? You can always say, mm -hmm. um, what I have so far is not fully formed yet. I'm probably 80% there, but here's what I've got so far. They could also say, um, you probably know this already, but I'm going to share it anyway, since I'm thinking about it. Um, by giving yourself that permission and license, that's all it takes. You know, you've yeah. already set that people up to perfect. set their... Yeah. Exactly. Because the alternative is you spend time in that meeting, keeping quiet. And to this day, people still can't read minds. They don't know what's going on right. in your head <laughs> if you don't speak up. And yes. until that happens, until we have that ability, one of the ways that, you know, if people really want to know what you're thinking, if you want to add value to that meeting, because you were invited to that meeting for a reason, then mm -hmm. learning how to speak up, lowering the barriers so that you can participate and add value, um, is tiny habits like these that lower yeah. the barrier to yeah. help you do the things that you need to do to perform a role. And right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's a good piece of advice for the leaders out there who are listening that they probably know or suspect <laughs> that they have a good mix of introverted employees in their, in their organization. And if you lead a team in tech, you probably have a lot of introverted employees. Um, we tend mm. to gravitate toward it. Engineers, designers, we, we do what we do because we like to work alone and we like to get things done and then come back together with people. There's a reason that a lot of introverts aren't product managers and I've, I've led product managers and designers and engineers, so I've seen it. So it's a good advice. What you were just saying is that I would love for individuals to learn how to give themselves permission, but I think a good leader should know when they need to do the same for their employees and to recognize mm -hmm. when someone doesn't want to speak up because they're probably a perfectionist or they're nervous about sounding stupid. And for them to be that bridge to the room to say, Hey, I'd love to hear what you have to say. And it's okay. We don't want anything perfect here. You know, just tell us what you're thinking to draw that out of people. And which I think is mm. wonderful. Um, another thing and as that a manager doing. Yeah. And as a manager, you could give them the heads up. Why surprise them? Yeah, exactly. Meeting? Don't, yeah. Don't surprise mm. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just say, you know, I'd love, because I think you know your people and I think you could do that in a one-on-one -on -one to say, I'd love to get your thoughts in the meeting and I'm going to encourage you and support you because there is nothing stupid, you know? And part of that, I mean, we had to do this in one organization with um, design critiques. People were getting pretty vicious. You know, they were like eviscerating the designer. Oh, that's stupid. That's a bad decision. That'll never work. And we said, this needs to be a lot more constructive. You know, we need to do this as a collaborative effort of helping them improve their design. We're not here to tear down their design. They're your partner, not your enemy. And, and so we had to change the tone to make it a welcoming room to feel like, hey, I'm going to share an idea. And maybe, maybe 90% of it's half-baked and it's not that great, but there might be that 10% that's like, oh, that's brilliant. That is a great idea. And we never would have heard it if we hadn't let you speak up and made you feel safe to speak up. That psychological safety that we've, we've talked about so much, mm. super important. And I still, mm. th I think to your point, I think it's a great thing to encourage people to share thoughts and feedback if they want ahead of time and let you be the conduit. So as a leader to say, 
hey, if you do, don't feel comfortable speaking up in the room, you know, if you're still really shy about it, but you have something you really want to share, because we're going to give you time to prepare and think about it, send it to me. You know, I, if you want me to give you credit, I will. If you want to be anonymous, I can do that too. Um, and I've been finding that with, I had like these fireside chats I was doing and some people quite comfortable asking their question in the zoom, right? They're like, Hey, I have a question and we're talking about it. And I realize other people aren't. And I said, just send me the, your question and I will keep it a hundred percent anonymous. I'm not going to mention your name, your company or anything like that. And I will answer your question in the meeting while you're listening, but you don't have to speak up and do it, which I got a lot of questions that way. Um, and I think if you don't do that, if you expect people to speak up, you're missing out on a huge amount of really valuable dialogue that could be happening. Mm. And I think we have to be more open to these other channels of communication that don't fit the model that we expect for the way uh, mm. outspoken extrovert employees talk. Mm. Yeah, And, you know, a lot of the meetings I go to these days, uh, they happen online. If it's an online yes. meeting, yeah. the way to be heard hasn't to, doesn't have to be speaking over another person mid-sentence. You could right. open up your chat yeah. window. You can yes. use back channels um, so that you can share your point of view uh, while somebody is speaking without interrupting them. Um, there oh, that's are, beautiful. There are yeah. a whole bunch. Yeah. There are so many ways that you can have your views heard in a way that you're comfortable in. Um, right that don't require you to fit that extroverted behavior of being excited and speaking over people. Right. I mean, if that's your way of yeah. working, that's great. Yeah. And I think it's important for leaders to really, if you're a leader or a manager of a team, um, like what you were saying earlier, to create a space where everyone can perform at their best. In yeah. some of the teams that I led, we... A lot of leaders or managers don't realize that when they start the team or inherit a team, that they can actually design the kind of uh, team that they would like to have. And one right. of the ways right. that I used to yeah. design how we operate was using team norms, like having a set of behaviors that says, this is our team norms, this is what we stand for, not values, uh, not mission statements, but really behaviors mm -hmm. of how we operate to get uh, good work done. One of those behaviors that we chose to adopt was to pass the mic. And this is a simple behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, usually when people speak in a meeting and when they're done talking, they just stop. <laughs> but the behavior <laughs> yeah, of passing yeah. the mic, it, it's really just after I finish speaking, just passing the mic to the next person. What do you think, John? What do you think, Larry? And mm -hmm. one of the struggles mm -hmm. that a lot of introverts have is to, to actually, it's not just it's just getting the attention of others um, to mm, actually speak up, mm. and we chose to adopt this behavior, this norm on our team, because our team was predominantly introverts. It was a global team. We met online frequently. Five out of six of us were introverts, with one extrovert mm, in the team. Wow, yeah, and and yeah, we needed a way to make sure that everyone's heard. Uh, funny story from that team. Uh, that one extrovert, um, when I started with that team, that one extrovert on the team always spoke up in meetings, always. 60-minute yeah. meeting, he'll be speaking for 45. When we <laughs> ran a workshop to define these team norms, um, some of the introverts were saying, um, you know, this person would be speaking so much. I felt like everything he said, I was thinking already. Um, mm. But some others also did share that you know, because the person was speaking up so much, um, they didn't feel like they had the time or space to be heard. Right. And right. when we when we asked the extrovert what they thought, um, they actually said, you know what, I was actually filling up the awkward silences because he knew that the silences oh. were especially hard for the introverts on the team. And he felt wow. like he was <laughs> he was going on and on to try and make them feel more comfortable. So oh. Huh. You know, that recognition, you know, trusting people's best intentions, um, figuring out how That's we can pass example. the yeah. microphone, um, just recognizing that, you know, there are other people in the room who may want to be heard. You know, that one simple behavior and recognizing the space that you hold and that you're taking up um, can create 
a much better working environment where you get the best from all people on your team, introverts right. and, and extroverts yeah. alike. So I want to kind of expand that outward into the, the greater arena of all online communication. You and I were just talking um, before we started the podcast about threads, <laughs> which mm. is kind of a, a hot topic. And it's, um, it's a very interesting experience as an introvert. Um, and I, and I was talking with Tim about it and I said, you know, I, I came in and I was, I was in there pretty early and it was exciting. It's a new opportunity to have a platform that doesn't have maybe some of the baggage of past platforms. And a lot of people were moving over and migrating from, um, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. They're like, I'm kind of been done with Facebook, but this is fun. Threads is kind of fun. Very interesting behavior was kind of happening in the first 72 hours of just constant posting and trying to be funny and funnier than the last person and um, get attention because the way the the feed is set up, you can get a lot of followers if you can bubble to the top and get attention because it's not, it's not showing you just the people you follow. It's showing you the world basically. And it's getting huge. There's like over a hundred million people now. But I, I quickly found myself doing what I do in every party, which is, hey, I kind of posted a few things. I'm interacting a little bit. And then it just got to be too much. Like there were people literally posting every 30 seconds and the same person over bam, 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 post, post, post. And I kind of found myself virtually backing away from the conversation. Like, okay, this is, this is like every party I've ever been to where the extroverted people are telling jokes and laughing and being funny and I can't get a word in edgewise and it's just not mean. So I just kind of withdrew. Um, and Tim had a kind of a different interpretation of how social media could actually encourage introverted people. And it's, I, I'm going to encourage him. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to him to talk a little bit about his observations of uh, social media and how it actually is beneficial in some ways for introverts. I actually think that social media is a gift from the introvert gods. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because uh, for, to help you understand my kryptonite, the thing that I hate the most is really networking in a room full of people that I don't know yeah. and saying hi yeah. and getting to know people. <laughs> and for me, when it comes to social media, um, it's really about having interesting conversations, meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I recall that's actually how you and I met, Larry. I think through I think, a mutual yeah, connection, I was following the stuff that you write online. And yeah, I was really interested to have a conversation with you because um, I saw so many parallels, so many um, things that I identify with. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I reached out. And the story about how I started using uh, social media actually goes way back. Um, when I started my career, user experience in Singapore was not a thing. Every author, every le thought leader in that field was overseas. And the only way that I could read or learn more about user experience was really following thought leaders that were outside of my country, that were in the US, that were in Europe. And over time, as I started following these people, and I heard what they had to say, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or it's, for some people, even on Facebook at the time. For me, it was really about having and starting meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of introverts I meet, they're like, um, what I have to say has been said already. Um, I don't want to, right. to say something foolish and make, and make a fool of myself. But really what I encourage them to do is your perspective is always unique and it's always interesting. You know, mm -hmm. you, it doesn't, you don't need, it'd be great if you have experience and experience will come over time as will competence. Right. But your view will always be interesting. And it's really about starting meaningful conversations with people on social media. It could be adding, yeah. a th adding to a thread. It could be liking a comment. It could be posting something meaningful. You know, not everything has to be a blog post. Not everything has to be an essay. Right. Um, networking and starting meaningful conversations on social media could be as simple as uh, sharing a meme, uh, sharing a funny sure. meme yeah. about introversion, yeah. for example. 
And <laughs> because if everything has to be an essay, if everything has to be a blog post, we don't have time for that. You know, it's right. about meaningful <laughs> things that you can do, like creating a content calendar of three sizes of content, small, medium, large, that you can spend 15 minutes every day just really interacting with people online and having a thoughtful conversation. And for me, that's how I network online. That's how I participate with social media online. It came from a place of sheer necessity because if I want to sure. learn about user <laughs> experience, I, that's how I did it. But over time, it actually led me to meeting people like yourself and other thought leaders in our field that I would never have had the opportunity to meet in person. Yeah, that's a good point. No, I like what you said about that. I've I've been trying to do more of what you were just describing is just putting out a sentence or two because um, I tend to write a lot of long stuff um, and that takes a lot of time and, and people don't have time to read it all. And so what I'm trying to do is whenever something kind of just strikes me, just a thought, I write it down really quickly. I like either Evernote or Ulysses or a paper notebook that I have, you know, and I'll just have a thought and I used to keep it to myself. And now I've just been putting it out. So I put it in threads or I put it in Substack has notes, um, which is another good place to do that kind of stuff. And I throw it out into the world because it's like, I kind of, I mean, I'm too old to put up with this stuff anymore. I'm not afraid anymore <laughs> as an introvert, but it's like, what's the worst that's going to happen? Somebody tells me it's stupid. Okay. So what? I don't care. I mean, what does that mean? Somebody halfway around the world tells me I'm stupid. Okay, fine. You know, but occasionally you will say something that clicks and you know, I, I met Tim. Um, and I, there's been some other people that have connected with me that, you know, I'll put out a whole bunch of stuff and maybe one out of 25 clicks with somebody and that's fine. You're not going to have like, you know, war and peace and every single thing that you write. That's some great novel, maybe one out of 25 hits. And somebody says, Hey, that really resonated with me. Hey, could we do a call? I'd like to talk more about that. You know, mm. Fantastic. And so I, yeah, if you're introverted and you're out there and you know, you have these really clever thoughts or insights or just questions, things that, you know, you wake up at two in the morning with a question in your mind about something, just put it out there. It's not going to hurt. It is not going to hurt you to just put it out there and you may find new friends that you never would have discovered otherwise. Right. Mm. I think Tim's right. Yeah. I should embrace it more myself. But uh, it is a gift. It is a gift. I, I should admit that that is a gift, even though it still scares me sometimes. Yeah, so <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I got to meet um, Bob Baxley, who I think you know as well. Oh, yeah, Bob. And, um, yeah, Bob and I know each he other. Showed yeah. me, he showed me his um, collection of notebooks where I think every day he would journal. But in particular, he would journal about um, a lesson from work that he learned that day. And uh, he showed me when we were on a Zoom call. And I was asking him, like, Bob, how did you, all these tweets that you're sending out, you seem to be sending them every single day. How, how do you yes, do yeah. <laughs> And he showed me. It was from a notebook. Um, he wrote it diligently for years. And what wow. you're seeing now is probably from months or even years before. And one piece of yeah, I didn't know that's cool. One piece of automation that he did was to actually schedule it in, you know, just schedule it in one post a day. You don't have to wake up okay. every morning and do it manually. You could always yeah, schedule nice. it in. That's nice. Yeah, that's brilliant. I was wondering because he started that. Oh, it may be two or three years ago. I noticed that Bob all of a sudden was posting a lot because Bob had been quiet for a while. And it was these really insightful stories, these short stories and thoughts about design and leadership and you name it. I was like, wow, he is so prolific now. And <laughs> I didn't realize that he was pulling it from years worth of notebooks. That's brilliant. I love it. I tell people to journal. Uh, I don't know how many take me up on it, but it is very cathartic. And uh, you look back and you see stuff that you wrote and you're like, oh, that was kind of clever. And I, I guess I had a lot of coffee that morning. I totally forgot about it. <laughs> it's a good way to put it back out into the world. Um, no, it's brilliant. I love that. I want to move into 
something that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts right now. So I work with a lot of people that have been struggling with this economy. Um, and I think we've all seen just so many layoffs and, and I know in the U S and I know there's a few internationally too. Um, and now some weird stuff that's going on, Airbnb led the charge and a whole lot of product management people are losing their jobs. We're like, we don't need product management anymore. <laughs> so people that thought they were pretty secure, um, just weird stuff going on in the, in the industry. So a lot of folks are hitting the market and they're, they have to do that thing that I think everybody dreads, but I think introverts in particular dread, which is getting ready for interviews. Um, and you coach a lot of people on this too. So what advice would you give the introverts listening? I guess it's probably useful for everyone to be honest about getting ready uh, for these interviews and doing the best they can. I started seeing this trend. Um, so oh, I, the quiet achiever, we offer two things. We offer courses and we offer one-on-one coaching. Um, mm -hmm. I started noticing a pattern starting from November, 2022. When a lot of introverts that were getting in touch with me were asking for advice to review their work portfolios, to mm -hmm. get interview ready, to rehearse, to run a mock interview. And I started doing more and more of these all the way up to today, actually. Um, and they struggle because what they find is like, every, like a lot of employees, when they're in a job, they're focused on their job. They are focused on doing a job well done. And then right. one day they wake up and they get a phone call and, or they find that they might be locked out from their uh, single right. sign-on yeah. account on their alarm. Yeah. Um, those are stories that I heard. Um, oh, and yeah. suddenly they find themselves on the market. They find themselves without a job. They find themselves having to worry about how they're going to pay their rent or their mortgage next month. And it's hard. Well, something yeah. that I tell a lot of the people I coach is you should always be interviewing. You should always be looking. Um, companies are there for a reason. Companies are there to serve, um, if they're a listed company, to sh serve their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And it's really mm -hmm. to your own benefit, I think, uh, to appear in demand and to always know what's out there. Um, the, the problem is that most people actually don't do that. And when they do yeah. start interviewing is when they do need a job. So in a lot of the coaching that I've done with them, we, 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 we share a couple of things. Number one, we try and break down the different shapes of interviews that they might go through. So the first one might be talking to the talent acquisition or the recruiter. That's the first interview. Then it might be a skills and portfolio interview where you get the person trying to assess the quality of your work. And then you might mm -hmm. have a cultural or role fit interview or behavioral interview as a third round. A lot of uh, the people that I coach never realized or saw it that way. And for each of these interviews, in my mind, there is an ideal shape. Um, you start off with an introduction, which many introverts struggle because they, right. when you try to introduce yourself, we try to talk about your accomplishments, they feel very shy. Eh? They don't feel comfortable right. talking about all their successes. And what I coach them through is really a simple way to talk about their accomplishments and talk through the key things that they've done. And to do it in less than five minutes in your intro mm -hmm. and then letting the mm -hmm. interviewer think about where else they want to go next. Um, a lot of the times when, we're, when I'm running mock interviews um, with, with the people that I coach, they have an intro that lasts 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long, <laughs> going through this right. thing at their first job, and then their 12th job, and then their seventh job. And it's just very hard to piece together the story they're trying to tell. And right. a lot of this is just not having practice. Um, yeah. And what I give them is really simple frameworks that they can, they can follow to structure their interviews in a way that makes sense. But at the same time, mm. also realizing that you do not know what the interviewer is looking for. So the best thing right. you can do is to give them a menu of things that you've done, like a quick spread of stuff that you've done, and then letting the interviewer choose, oh, I want to go deeper on that. I want to go deeper on this. Right. I think that's relevant. Yeah. 
and then letting the interviewer choose. And pretty much that's it. We also talk about things like how to practice behavioral questions, what to do when you're asked a question on the spot that you don't have um, an answer to. Right. Uh, we have some tactics for those kind of things. Um, but the goal is a very simple one, just to give people enough of a frame so that when they do go for an interview, that they feel prepared, that they feel well-practiced, right. that they're not rushing and speaking faster because they're nervous. Um, and all right. these right. tiny habits, again, they add up to, to a successful interview and hopefully help people get the jobs that they really want. Right. Yeah. No, that's good advice. You're, you're right. That is probably the biggest thing I have to work with people on is that intro where it's like, it's long and rambling. It's like, this isn't the entire interview in the first question, right? And your advice is great. It's like, just give people a sampling across and then they can say, Oh, let's dive deeper on that project or your time at that company. Yeah. You don't have to tell your life story. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's great advice. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we're almost out of time. I wanted to see if there was any final things that you wanted to talk about. And I want to make sure people know where to find you because that's important because you've offered uh, the, the courses that you have, the coaching that you have, and you have a lot of wonderful insights about introversion and helping people succeed in their careers. So I want to make sure that they can find you after this. Mm, of course. Thanks for the opportunity. So I think the easiest way to find me is to search for my name and the quiet achiever. So just look for Tim Yeo, Y-E-O, The Quiet Achiever. Um, I should be one of the top results there. Um, it'll be a blue website that you see when you click on the link. We offer two things, one-on-one -on -one coaching and courses. Um, and we offer two courses today. The first course is Interviews for Introverts. It's a one-week course, not full-time, probably three to four hours in, over the course of the week, where we mm. help set you up for success for interviews. We also have a second course called Leadership for Introverts, where we go through things like how to perform in meetings, how to network online and in real life, how to do public speaking well, uh, which is something mm -hmm. a lot of introverts struggle with. Um, and we do that over, over four weeks. Uh, there are a couple more courses coming up uh, soon over time, like how to be more visible in your organization, but all that will come in the future. Um, if you wanted to reach out and have a discovery call, feel free to sign up. Um, it's a link on the website. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, yeah, this has been great. We've been talking for so long. I, I was like, it's time to get you on the podcast. We should talk about what you do and make sure people can find you. Because, uh, yeah, every time we talk, we always say, wow, we should talk again soon. <laughs> it's always It's always a rich conversation. So thanks for making the time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. Take care. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life. <laughs>